Hey, good morning, folks. Um, I am feeling a little under the weather still, so I am making this video so that we do not fall even further behind on our schedule. So I'm just going to do a little bit of the introduction to the Renaissance. So let's just get into it. So when we've been talking about the Middle Ages, we always kind of say from the fall of the Western Roman Empire to the beginning of the Renaissance. Well, here we are. It's the Renaissance, and it's a French word for rebirth. And what that means is sort of like not a rebirth of people necessarily, although there is um, some sense of many different types of booms in the population, but not necessarily just more people. It means a rebirth of culture. And one of the ideas, uh, the philosophical ideas that underpins um, this era is humanism. It's an intellectual and cultural movement where we sort of care about the individual human being. So think back to um, Hildegard's uh, penitent soul. It's supposed to be like an analog for every person, as if every person is the same. Well, one of the things in the Renaissance um, is that we sort of give uh, some weight to what each and every person might want. Now, let's not mistake ourselves. When we think about each and every person, we're thinking about each and every person who has some influence or money or is noble. We're not talking about every single person yet. Um, we're, we're not in that place necessarily. But there is definitely a rebirth of the pursuit of science, philosophy, literature, painting, sculpture, and music. Um, vocal music is really big in the Renaissance. Again, um, we talked in the uh, Middle Ages about vocal music kind of being the big thing. We did have some um, instrumental music, especially played in courts. Um, vocal music is pretty big here. Uh, and one of the ideas that people, composers, really want to do is they want to unite words and music. So they want the, uh, the music to match what the words say. Um, that idea is going to be called word painting, and this is the first introduction we're going to have to it, but it's going to come up in pretty much every era from here on out. So one of the other big cultural features of this time is that during the Renaissance, we have the Protestant Reformation. And so it becomes kind of important to know the difference between Catholics and Protestants. Um, so with Catholics, um, there is a Pope. Uh, he is the infallible vicar of Christ. He is a stand-in for Jesus. He is the voice of God on earth. Um, so the Pope is like a big deal. He is the ultimate interpreter um, of God's word, of the Bible, of all of it. Um, so Catholics, especially during this time, have an idea that, hey, look, lay people, I know that y'all are getting real uppity with your book learning and everything, um, but priests, monks, the Pope, we're still the ultimate interpreters of the Bible, of the Word of God. You may think you know something about that, but you don't. So that's kind of where Catholicism stands during this era, um, and the Pope is like the number one. So um, the saints are also important. Uh, there are even some Protestant churches that um, care a whole lot about saints. I will say that in the denomination that I ascribe to, Episcopalianism, saints are kind of a big deal. Um, but Catholics see them a little bit differently. So Protestant denominations will recognize saints as like cool people that have done amazing things that maybe we should emulate in our own lives. Catholics see um, saints as the ability to be an intermediary between them um, and Jesus or God. So um, there are saints for all kinds of different things. Um, Saint Joseph can help you sell your house. So instead of praying to God and saying, God, would you please help me sell my house? Um, a, a Catholic would pray to Saint Joseph to uh, help them sell their house. And then St. Joseph is supposed to sort of ask Jesus, hey, would you mind helping out, you know, the soldiers with selling their house? Um, 
In fact, if you know a Catholic, there's a very interesting little ritual when you're going to sell your houses that you purchase a statuette of St. Joseph and you bury him in the yard um, when you are hoping to sell your house. Um, the rest of my family is Catholic, and this is done on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, Catholics believe that only the Roman Catholic Church can interpret scripture. Um, so again, you know, the Pope is the all time, like the big interpreter. If he says something about the Bible, it goes and everybody says, yep, he's the Pope. He knows it better than anybody else. He's the standing for God on earth. So if he says that that's what this means, then that's what this means. Um, Protestants at this time, what ends up happening is they say, no, 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 no. Anybody has that authority. If the word of God is infallible, then any person ought to be able to read it and be led to the right choices in their life to lead a good life. It's not only priests and nuns and monks and the Pope that can tell us to do that. Um, people should be able to read the Bible and um, make the right choices for themselves. So those are you know, really, really big um, differences. And then there's some small ones. Um, we have, uh, Protestants have sacraments in their life, Catholics have seven sacraments, baptism, confirmation, taking the Eucharist, doing penance, anointing of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony. Um, here's one that is really big for Catholics. If you have gone to, um, Mass. We talked about Mass last time, and um, we're talking about when you take communion. So in your Protestant church, if you are a Protestant, when you take communion, you, know, you might um, have wafers or bread, um, wine or grape juice or something like that. Um, the idea for Catholics is that when the... Uh, um, the priest or the pastor or whoever in Catholicism, it's going to be the priest. Um, when the priest says the words over those materials, they literally become the body and blood of Christ. They're not a stand in for the body or blood of Christ. They are the literal body of Jesus. So when you eat that bread, you're eating Jesus, not just the representation of the Last Supper, you are literally participating in it. And that process is called transubstantiation. And that is one of those big differences between Catholics and Protestants. Um, Catholics have their 10 holy days of obligation, where Catholics must attend Mass on those days. Um, really strict Catholics absolutely do that. Uh, people who will call themselves Catholics, but not necessarily go to those, um, still call themselves Catholics, and they don't always go to those. Um, two of them definitely are um, Easter and Christmas, and then there are others. Um, so scripture, here's the difference. Um, to Protestants, scripture is the word of God. And to Catholics, the tradition and ritual that surrounds the word of God is just as important as the scripture. And then um, with Catholics, there is the idea that people who are involved in the clergy um, must be celibate. Again, that's just Roman Catholicism because we've already talked about the fact that Byzantine Catholicism is different. Byzantine priests and nuns can be married, um, have spouses and children, whereas Roman Catholic priests and nuns cannot. Um, the idea of holy water is largely um largely Catholic, and the idea of purgatory. Um, purgatory is a big-time Catholic idea. It's sort of like where you work off your sins before you can get to heaven. You're not damned to hell forever, but you need to go to purgatory and suffer for a little bit before um, you go to heaven. And actually, this is where one of the big, um, the big splits from the Catholic Church happened during the Renaissance. Um, Catholic priests used to sell these things called indulgences. And so what people would do is if they had money, they would buy a, a piece of paper and it was like buying their sins away. There was less time spent in purgatory if they would give this money. And um, Martin Luther, who's the driving force behind the Protestant Reformation, was like, hey, Hold on just one second here, you guys. Um, so what you're saying is that a rich man or a rich woman can 
is guaranteed salvation, essentially. As long as they've got deep enough pockets, um, they're guaranteed salvations, no matter what terrible things they've done. Um, he said, that just doesn't sound right to me. And the Catholic Church was like, listen, dude, you're just a monk, and how about you slow your roll for a hot second here? Um, but he, he didn't. So um, this guy down here in the right-hand corner, that is a portrait of Martin Luther. Um, he was an Augustinian friar. And when we say things like Benedictine, like Hildegard was a Benedictine nun, um, Martin Luther was an Augustinian friar, those are just different orders of Catholicism. It just means that some of the rituals and some of the things that they do are based on the lives of a specific saint. Saint Benedictine is... Um, one saint, an early saint, and St. Augustine is another early st early saint. And so their orders, the way that they live their lives and some of the rituals they go through are based on the lives of that saint. So um, Martin Luther was an Augustinian friar, so like a monk, and he saw all of these things happening in the Catholic Church and was like, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff going on here that maybe shouldn't be going on. It seems like maybe that's just not right. So in 1517, um, he wrote the 95 Thesis, and the way that the legend goes is that he, you know, nailed them to a church door. Um, that's one of the reasons why earlier in the year we had the 500th um anniversary of his having done that. Um, there were choral pieces and all kinds of things sung. It was like a big deal for Protestantism this fall, because uh, that's when that happened. And the Catholic Church, you know, actually, they have a reputation for being pretty salty about some of these things, maybe not always the most kind, but they did give Martin Luther some opportunities. They were like, hey, hey, how about you just go ahead and take all of that back and pretend like you didn't say any of that, and we can just keep going on as we were. Um, and he said, "No, I don't think I will." And they said, "Well, you're gonna you're gonna go to hell." And he said, "You know, I think I'm okay with that because um, I don't know if I believe the same things that you guys believe anymore." So in 1520, they excommunicated him. They were like, "All right, you can't be a Catholic anymore. No more Catholicism for you, Martin Luther." So he said, well, all right, I'll uh, start my own church. And he did in 1526. So if you've ever heard of the denomination of Protestantism called Lutheranism, it's kind of a big deal, particularly in um, Northern Europe, um, particularly Germany, where uh, Luther was from, uh, then that is after Martin Luther. So... The Reformation, this Protestant Reformation, actually has a bit of an effect on music. Um, so what happens with a lot of the countries are, uh, again, they're not quite the nation states that we uh, have on a map, especially right now. We've got uh, an age of exploration, in quotes, happening where um, some of these big powers in Europe are getting on boats and going around the world exploiting brown people. Um, enslaving them and stealing all their stuff. And so um, we have places in Africa and the Caribbean, the United States, as we know it today, Canada, South America, uh, and Asia that are all technically parts of other European countries. So again, you know, when we talk about um, the country, remember that the boundaries aren't necessarily what we think of them to be today. But in some of those places, the faith of the monarch who rules that area sort of determines the faith of the realm. Um, during this time, England was Protestant. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So um, England was a Protestant country, and they actually kind of flipped back and forth. Most people are like, how did that happen exactly? Because... Um, England was a big-time Catholic country and held some favor with the Pope. Henry VIII was actually uh, considered one of the better Catholic uh, rulers um, in Europe. Uh, and the lady that we're looking at here in the right-hand corner is Elizabeth I, 
uh, Queen Elizabeth I, and she is Henry VIII's daughter by one of his other wives that is not his first wife. This is actually one of the reasons that the split happens in England. Henry VIII said, hey, look, you know, things are not working out between Isabella, not Isabella, heavens, Catherine of Aragon and I. It's just not going well. Things are not good. And um, he wanted a divorce. Now, divorces were not terribly uncommon. It was um, entirely normal for a monarch to uh, divorce a spouse, but they had to have a special dispensation from the Pope. And here's where this whole split thing comes in, is that Catherine of Aragon is the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, who, of Spain, who are considered to be the most Catholic monarchs in um, Europe at the time. And so the Pope could either really tick off Ferdinand and Isabella, even though Isabella was dead at this time, but that's neither here nor there. Um, he could really tick off Spain, who has a lot of power and is definitely doing a lot in the age of exploration at this point in time, giving the Pope a lot of influence and what have you. He can either cut those ties and tick those people way off, or he can piss off Henry VIII, who, when it comes down to the age of exploration, he was kind of late to the game, and England is a really far-off island that's not on the continent, and the Pope kind of doesn't care. So he was like, you know what? I know things were sketchy between you and your wife in the first place because she was your brother's wife, and now you found out all this kind of stuff, and there's like a good reason for you to divorce her, at least in your mind and in everybody else's mind. It's been done for less, but I'm not going to give you a divorce. And so Henry VIII was kind of like, you know what? This is ridiculous. I know that as far as the religion goes, there's no reason that you shouldn't grant me this divorce. This is bullcrap. So I'm going to go and form my own church. And so he does. The Anglican Church, which the Church of England, which is what Episcopalianism in the United States is, comes from there. It is a lot of Catholicism. It's like, Catholic light, but with some, you know, really important differences in it. Well, the issue is that Henry VIII changes everybody over. He's like, well, guess what? You're all Protestant now. Well, his daughter, um, from his marriage with Catherine of Aragon, um, Mary the first, she was incredibly Catholic. Her mother was Catholic. She was really cheesed off about what Henry VIII did to her mother and so when she takes power, she's like, well, guess what, England? You're going back to Catholicism. And they actually called Mary the first Bloody Mary because um, she killed a lot of Protestants, like a lot of them. That's how she got that name. Well, after she passes and her half-sister Elizabeth I takes the, the throne, she is a Protestant um, queen, and so everybody becomes a Protestant. Um, so this switcheroo happens in England, um, and whatever the monarch is, is what everybody else in the land is supposed to be. So some places are like big time holdouts for Catholicism. Think of places like Spain, Italy, Portugal. Those are going to be um, some of your big time uh, Catholic monarchies. France is sort of in the middle. It's Catholic, but then there are um, some Protestant sections of France. There are actually some wars that go on about that. Um, Germany, um, the areas we call the Low Countries, those are uh, largely Protestant. Not entirely, but a lot of them. But Germany, again, is not really a, a Germany, like the kingdom of Germany yet. It's a whole bunch of smaller kingdoms at this point in time who all kind of work together, but they're still their own kingdoms. We don't get a unified Germany until about 1871. So um, Germany, as we know it today, is not really a thing on the map yet. Um, but areas where people speak German tend to be largely um, Protestant at this time, although there are, you know, pockets of Catholicism all through there. And then Eastern Europe tends to be um, mostly Catholic with some mix of Byzantine or other things um, happening in there. So as far as music goes, what ends up happening is that Protestantism makes a big change to the music. They say, look, if the Bible is for everybody, 
then the music should be for everybody too. We're going to quit with this Latin nonsense. Not everybody speaks Latin. Now, if everybody is starting, you know, we're given masses and the language of the place. Um, so if you go to a Protestant service or an Anglican service in England, it's going to be given in English. If you go to one in Germany, it's going to be given in German. And so they said, you know what, this music that's being used to glorify God, it should also be in that language. So we started having religious music written um, in English, in German, in French, in these places that are Protestant. Um, but in places that are still Catholic and, you know, you're going to a Catholic mass, you now the mass is still in Latin and the music is still in Latin. Um, so we've got that change. So the Protestants are going to the language of the people. The Catholic composers are like, well, guess what? We're, we're going to make our music as beautiful as humanly possible because people will see that this music is glorifying God and they'll be back to Catholicism. We're not going to get ruined by this whole, you know, Protestant upstart thing. And, and to be truthful, that's never really happened. There was a split from the Catholic Church. Protestants went off and did their things. But Catholicism is still, you know, like big all over the, all over the globe. Um, so it happened. And, you know, it, both churches survived just fine. All right, so there were big-time benefits for musicians in the Renaissance. There was a huge economic growth. Um, one of the big reasons that this happened um, is that the age of, in quotes, exploration occurred. I don't like that term. Like, I get it. Europeans went on boats, and they went places they had never been before, but they didn't discover people. Those people definitely existed before, before the Europeans ever came there. Um, but part of folks getting on boats and finding things that they had not found before, you know, gold, crops, animals, people that they could sell into slavery, all of those things, that meant a lot of money. So there was a huge economic growth during the Renaissance. Um, Italy, the Low Countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, definitely Spain and Portugal. Um, there is a ton of money happening there. In fact, Spain and Portugal were the only game in town for such a long time that there was a doctrine uh, essentially about, you know, here's what belongs to Portugal, here's what belongs to Spain, all over the world. Um, and when France and England finally got into it, it was kind of like, yeah, well, we're going to ignore your doctrine actually, and just kind of do our own thing over here. Um, so, yeah, that happened. Um, but then more wealth. Remember that uh, back in the Middle Ages, we said that people with money like to show that they had money by having, you know, art, essentially. Um, paint a portrait of me, make a sculpture of me, write songs for me, perform for me, all of those things. And so um, more wealth equaled more demand for the arts. Composers and musicians could make a ton of money during this time because way more people had money. There was an emerging middle class of like traders, people that weren't necessarily noble, but definitely people that had money. And so um, that was important. And an interesting thing that happens here is that people want to become smart um, a renaissance man, some of you may have heard that term before, um, it's when somebody becomes well-versed in arts, sciences, philosophy, um, it, part of that was becoming musically educated as well. So people would become, you know, they'd take lessons on an instrument. They would learn to sing and play an instrument. Um, rich people would make sure that their daughters and sons were, you know, musicians of some kind. Um, women usually, usually learn to play keyboard instruments and sing. Um, men might play other instruments as well. So again, the idea of individuality, that's a big deal, um, during this time, that humanistic philosophy. Um, there's the confidence in the power of humans, individuals, art becomes definitely more personal. When you think about Hildegard's innocent soul and then take one of Shakespeare's characters, most people have had to read Shakespeare at some point in their lives, so take a character that you know from Shakespeare. One of my favorites is Beatrice from Much Ado About Nothing. Um, but the soul in Hildegard von Bingen's play of 
uh, virtues is just a symbolic stand-in for mankind. But Beatrice, she is a, a character. She's a real person that has emotions and faults and feelings, and she is fiery and, you know, just all these beautiful things. Um, but she is developed as a person and as being different from other characters in the play, whereas that doesn't really happen um, in Middle Ages uh, plays. We don't really care about the everyman uh, or what each individual person is. We just like, all right, mankind, hee-haw, be good, people. And now, you know, it, with humanism, it's kind of like, well, everybody is a little bit different, and we should care about how people are different. So composers write music that they feel captures emotion and communicates text or meaning, um, that idea of word painting. So if you have a, a song that is about um, water, they're going to want to make it sound like water. Um, let's take a real quick look at um, As Vespa Was Descending. Well, no, let's not. We might save it for next time. I think we can, because this is already getting pretty long. So just take a look again at our um, Middle Ages art. This is a tapestry over here. Not a whole lot of detail in the people. I mean, you can tell who are men and who are women and which one is Jesus, right? Um, but they're all just kind of like analogs for a human body. Over here in Renaissance art, there's so much more detail in the background, in the people, in their features. Um, and yay for, you know, full rounded figures in the Renaissance. Being stick thin was not the thing. You could not survive a hard winter. Um, and that was not desirable in the Renaissance. Um, one of the other huge things about this time is movable type. Johannes Gutenberg. You may have heard of the Gutenberg Bible. This is him on the far left. He invents a system of movable metal type printing around 1450. This is a model of the Gutenberg press um, and it allows for massive inf information transmission much more cheaply than having somebody write out a book. Now let's not play around. Books are still not cheap. They're not necessarily cheap in the sense that you could just go to a corner store and buy one, um, but they're definitely less expensive than having a scribe sit there for two years and write you out a copy of, a, of the Bible. Um, so what ends up happening is that information gets transmitted much more easily, and also music gets transmitted much more easily. There are actually composers that become really well known throughout Europe because of the invention of movable type. Um, Josquin is actually one of those. Um, so yay, we are going to work on Josquin the next time we're together. So know this here information um, from this slide to that slide uh, for Friday. And I hope you guys have a great rest of the day.